everyone, welcome to the episode of Table at Home. Today we are at the last little park at the community garden. Before um, I begin this pruning demonstration, I wanted to say that this week at the table we're celebrating our volunteers. It's the Volunteer Appreciation Week. Unfortunately, we are unable to host our uh, appreciation dinner for volunteers this year, so we are using other ways to, to thank everyone who is involved in our organization. Here at the garden, there's a big group of gardeners who help make the food come together. The food is shared in, uh, within the group and also goes to the programs at the table, the food bank, and the community kitchen. So thank you everyone for all your hard work. In terms of uh, an update on what's happening with the garden program, we are still waiting for the decision to be reversed. Uh, the garden, the community gardens have been put on a non-essential list. So um, there's a lot of work being done to towards reversing that decision. And I'm feeling very hopeful and um, pretty sure that we'll be planting trees by next week. So here we are. Uh, we're going to be pruning in our forest garden today. So the, the forest garden is an area between our production gardens where we have uh, a mix of trees, uh, shrubs, and, um, and perennial edible plants. So um, we have pear trees, we have a cherry tree, we have apples, we have uh, different berry bushes. So we have blackberries, black currants, uh, red currants, which I'm going to be demonstrating pruning on today. And our lower um, uh, sort of a ground cover zone is comprised of um, edible perennial plants. So we have sage, we have thyme, uh, sorrel, anything that is going to come back every year. And we've tried to incorporate um, a lot of education and usage of these plants in our programs as well. So uh, we even have daylilies here. You guys didn't know that you can eat daylily uh, flowers. Uh, it's your tip for today. So when you are enjoying your summer perennials and you see those beautiful day daylily flowers, uh, taste them. They taste really good. Joanna, do you have to take the stamens out before you eat them? Do you just eat the petals or the whole thing? Uh, I guess you can take them out, or you could do some research about it. Um, I usually just take the petal and, and eat it one at a time. You can cut it, you know, you can probably slice it up thin and put it in the salad. I've been bench sizing about taking the whole flower and serving ice cream in it. Yeah, I'm thinking, could you like deep fry them like a zucchini blossom for a savory a take on it? Yeah, you yeah. probably could experiment with that. Cool. Lots of options. All right, so today our demonstration is going to be on pruning. So it's a perfect time of year to think about pruning our fruit, uh, fruit shrubs and trees, but also our ornamentals. So um, my intention today is to give you uh, basic information that can be applied to pruning anything um, that you have around, whether it's a pruning bush or your ornamental spirea in your perennial bush. successful at pruning. I'm very, very particular about tools because pruning uh, is really, um, it's kind of injuring the plant if you think about it. We're opening, uh, we're opening the tissue and exposing it to elements. So if we are using tools that are not sharp or are poor quality, then we could be doing more damage than good. So we're going to start with uh, talking about secateurs. So I have a pair of Felco secateurs that I wear on my belt here. I'm going to pull my holster off. So I have my secateurs. They come in a handy holster. Felco is my favorite brand of secateurs that are, they are um, a little bit expensive, but if you take care of them and keep track of them, the red handle is easy uh, to track them. Uh, you will really 
only need one pair in their lifetime if you take care of them. They have a very good quality blade, and if you keep it sharp, um, you should be able to, to just use it for, for as long as you need. The most important thing about sharpening your tools is that they come with an angle on the blade, and when you're sharpening your tools, you need to maintain that angle. Uh, so your secateurs will cut from anything that is under one inch in diameter. So quarter inch to half inch preferably. Um, you really don't want to be cutting anything uh, bigger than that because then you're going to start squishing the, uh, the branch and then causing damage. So also very important to remember that these are uh, meant for cutting wood. So we can be tempted to, you know, grab it to cut wire or something in the garden. The Felcos actually have a little, little uh, kind of groove at the bottom of the blade, which is intended for cutting floral wire. So if you're using these to make your wreaths in the winter time, uh, they come very handy for cutting very small wire, nothing big. So again, they come with a nice hol uh, holster. It goes on your belt and then they kind of become part of you <laughs> in the garden. It's, uh, it's nice to have them nice and handy. I know, you wear that holster like I wear earrings. There you go. <laughs> yes, very good. Because I don't have a cool holster, oh, wow. so that's why I wear earrings. Oh, I can have a cool holster. <laughs> All right, so the next, uh, the next cool we can talk about is a pair of loppers. I don't know why I'm putting these on, but... Uh, so again, these whoppers are, you can see, uh, someone cut wire with them mm. a long time ago. Oh yeah. Uh, I've had these for 15 years and they are um, my favorite pruners. They're nice and heavy and again, it's all about the quality of the blade. Uh, with, the, with the secateurs or the clippers as some people call them, you can also replace the blade too, so uh, that is always a good attribute. But what, uh, yeah, so quality is really, really important with your tools. And if you maintain them, you keep them sharp, you keep them clean, you don't leave them out in the rain, um, they'll last you forever. So they are worth the investment. Uh, so the loppers will cut anything between one, uh, a half an inch to an inch. And, um, Again, keeping them sharp is the key. So next, we're gonna move on to a handsaw because handsaws are our last resort uh, when it comes to bigger, um, bigger tools. I'm gonna backtrack just one second and talk about uh, two different types of, uh, of loppers. So we have the bypass loppers. If you can see, they have two blades that kind of pass each other like that. And then, uh, and then we have what are called the anvil loppers. So there's a, there's kind of a tape, uh, like a, you know, a piece here and the blade meets in the middle. So I would highly recommend the bypass loppers because when we use anvil uh, pruners, they actually crush, there's more potential for crushing the branch. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they're not as, you know they're not as fine it, it would be harder to to do a good quality cut um, and not leave a stub as well which we'll, we will talk about so our hand saws again um, because I do a lot of pruning I uh, you know I invest a lot into my tools I use these professional Japanese saws so there's uh, uh, the brand is silky and again this saw has been working for few years now it's it is due for replacing of the blade so I just replace the blade every um, I don't know four four or five years they're really sharp um, but it's still sharp enough for me to prune this year Joanna where would you get a replacement ba blade back with the company yeah so if you go on the on the website that any website that sells silky saws right uh, will sell replacement bl blades as well um, when it comes to a homeowner brand, what I like to recommend is a Corona saw. So um, it's it's half the price. It's good quality, and you can get those at Home Hardware or Home Depot as well. So they carry 
good hand saws and good loppers as well. So uh, Corona is my next kind of uh, middle ground brand that I like to recommend. And if anybody else has, you know, ideas and brands to, to share with us, please do. Because uh, there's, you know, it's a, it's a very big world out there. And uh, uh, I like to learn from, from everyone as well. So uh, the last saw that uh, is kind of makes me very excited is my little turkey saw. So this saw does not have a replacement option but uh, I love it because I can get, you know, I can get right in here and cut, um, cut in between without causing any damage. I couldn't really do that with the big saw, you know, I would start cutting other things around it. So this is my, my kind of fine uh, detail saw that comes really handy when it comes to pruning shrubs and small trees. So, um, and the last, tool or uh, you know a, a piece of gear that I, I, I really really recommend everyone to get in the habit of using safety glasses um, I have poked my eyes with branches just when I was cleaning them on the ground um, so it's really important it just kind of creates the ease when you're moving around a plant to um, to protect your eyes you don't have to think about whether you're gonna get stabbed or not so uh, safety glasses are uh, an important element when you're pruning. So, um, hey, so do safety glasses ever come with UV protection? Because you know we're often told to wear sunglasses outside. Can you get a two for one? Yeah, so you can wear your sunglasses, right? Uh, for sure, anything that will protect your your eyes, and they do come. Uh, in, the safety glasses do come with UV protection too. You yeah. can get those, um, you know, at Rental Village or places that kind of sell um, you know saws or equipment they are they are available I have, I have seen those around yes and I guess the benefit of the safety glasses is they wrap well around your head yes for right sure. you're not they going to get flying them. debris in the sides yeah, yeah for sure yes so another thing uh, that I will talk about is alcohol so um, it has become very uh, essential to carry alcohol with us I like to use uh, rubbing alcohol on my tools to sterilize my tools when I um, prune different, you know, if, I, if I'm pruning, um, you know, an entire orchard and some trees are infected and some trees aren't, so fire blight is a big concern. Um, I like to always have this around and just spray my tools in between and then know that I'm not spreading any diseases. Uh, anything in the rose family, which are um, all most of our fruit trees and shrubs are in the rose family, are kind of very prone to to diseases. So it's uh, it's a good idea. I wouldn't recommend using bleach uh, because it can make your tools rust. So rubbing alcohol in the little bottle comes in handy for more than just hand sanitizing. Okay, so um, the other thing I guess we can talk about is uh, sharpening your tools so you can use you know you can drop them off at, at a local sharpening place they'll probably use a grinder which will heat up your blade and therefore make it um, kind of more brittle over a long period of time so if you use a, a stone or a diamond blade on regular basis just you know do a few passes on your blade and keep it sharp you don't let your tools go too far um, it will be easier to keep them um, sharp for longer. Um, okay, so uh, I, have, I have my little notes here so I don't get distracted because this might uh, be going to be reaching for them. I do have um, some book recommendations. So uh, when we start pruning, um, the first thing that you know, I, I'm coming to this plant and what do I do with it? So the first thing I want to think about is what is it? I can't really start pruning it until I know what it is because every plant has different uh, needs. So why would I need to know um, what is it? Does it uh, fruit on, uh, does it flower on last year's wood? So, uh, or this year's wood because if uh, let's say it's a it's a lilac 
and I go and prune it really hard right now, I'm going to prune all the flower buds off. So generally what happens is anything that flowers in the spring already has its uh, flower buds set last year. So we prune that after it flowers for, there's a window of time for about four to six weeks that we can prune prune the plant before it sets those buds for next year. If we again prune it too late in the summer, we're going to cut the buds that were already set. So um, if it blooms in the, uh, like in the fall, like our hydrangea for example, we can cut it back to the ground because it will set the flower buds this year. So um, that is why we really need to consider those, those elements. When it comes to fruiting, uh, fruiting trees, they, uh, you know, I need to know what it is because I want to know what year wood it sets its uh, fruit on. So I wanted to recommend my, uh, so I have a book called The Pruning of Trees and Shrubs and Conifers. And this book goes um, into pruning and it has uh, all the different types of plants. So I can look up Forsythia, I can look up your uh, Spirea, I can look up uh, sorry, excuse me. By, uh, bless you. Yeah, sorry about that. By, you know, by the name of the plant, and it will give me a description of what I need to do. Uh, when it comes to um, fruit, I, I love Michael <laughs> Phillips. He's a, a fellow from the United States. He has a great book called The Apple Grower. Um, and he goes deep into the subject of growing apples uh, organically. And he also has an amazing book called The Holistic Orchard. And this um, dives into a little bit of permaculture and a lot of soil building practices and um, a lot of really good information. So, um, so we have decided that this is a, um, we know now that this is a, uh, a red currant. Red currant will fruit on wood that is one to three years old. So I'm going to focus today on um, pruning uh, the oldest canes. Cause I, and I wanna thin out, I will thin out. So anything that's really uh, thin and spindly, I'm going to also take out. So the idea of pruning shrubs, uh, I'm going to work right at the bottom uh, on the crown level. And uh, the idea is to create air circulation and select the canes that are going to be, uh, that are the healthiest and most, most productive. So before, uh, before I begin, uh, I want to think about the three, uh, three D's. So it, dead, disease, damaged, and then crossing and interfering. So if you remember uh, those words, and you remember that before you prune anything, uh, that's where you want to start. Because there could be a tendency of coming to a plant and saying, oh, I'm going to cut this out, cut this out. And then all of a sudden, I realized I didn't cut out any of the dead wood. And once I cut out the dead wood, the plant looks completely different. So it's very important, uh, and maybe this applies a little bit more to trees, is that start with the dead, because once you remove the dead, um, you'll get a very different picture. So it's really, uh, some people might say, oh, how do I know that something is dead in this, you know, before the leaves are on it? So usually you can tell the dead wood in the spring and winter, uh, because the de the buds are dry so the buds will be i don't have a piece of deadwood here but you can see the buds are nice and plump they're already starting to break uh, which means they're starting to grow where a dead bud um but yeah we have a dead bud here so here you can see these buds are dry and they uh they don't really have any life in them so even when you look at trees uh the bark will start falling off of them and um it's amazing how much you can actually see a dead branch in a bigger tree when you really, uh, really look at it. So, dead, diseased, uh, damaged, crossing, and interfering. Those are, uh, that's kind of our, our beginner mantra. And then, uh, 
when when pruning shrubs, what I the first thing I want to do is get right to the bottom. So the important thing is going to be to not leave any any stubs. So stubs are you know those pieces of wood that you'll see uh, and you know they'll be dead. Uh, and if we leave stubs. They will be. They will die until they 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 reach, uh, and you know, a point where the branch has a node, so where the next branch would be coming. And then we have these dead sticks uh, that are potentials for disease because they'll be rotting. So anything rotting and wet will kind of attract diseases. So we want to keep things as clean as possible. Uh, and as you see, my safety glasses are coming in very handy here because I can just get right in here. I don't think this was pruned ever, so there's no... This is a perfect time uh, to get this going. So you might be answering this question as we move along, Joanna, but approximately how much can you prune in one season? So with trees, you don't want to take out more than 30% of the plant. And this is after you've removed the deadwood. And um, I would kind of think about, you know, a similar number with shrubs. Right. You, you generally want to, um, you always, what I always do is I always look at the size of my branch pile on the ground in comparison to, um, you know, to the, as I'm pruning it and also too you know again what are you pruning are you pruning a lilac or a forsythia because uh, you can you can mow those right down to the ground and you know if you want to rejuvenate those plants you can you can prune them a lot harder to uh, to keep some young growth uh, going and they will not be affected so it's really important to know again what you're pruning if I was pruning a potentilla for example you know, I would be bit much more uh, gentle in how I approach it because it doesn't have the same uh, response. So, you know, if a plant has a very strong response to suckering, like uh, forsythia or a lilac, then I know I can prune it a lot harder. And also too, if I, uh, in the winter time, when we prune in the dormant season, um, pruning in the dormant season promotes growth. It's a natural response. Uh, of the plant um, to to shoot out more growth so that's why we need to know how the plant responds to pruning uh, because in the winter when I prune something that responds really strong then it might be an advantage or it might be a disadvantage if I'm pruning an apple that has a very some apples have a very strong suckering uh, tendency and others don't um, and if I'm pruning an apple that has a very strong suckering tendency, I'm going to prune as little as possible because I don't want to create all these shoots, you know, coming mm. up after and creating more mess than good. So generally always, uh, I tend to prune on, on the, you know, more gentle side and, uh, and again, knowing, knowing your plant, knowing how, to, how it responds. If I'm pruning an apple that needs to be rejuvenated, um, you know, I will maybe tag branches that uh, with tape that need to be uh, removed, and then I would do it later in the summer mm -hmm. when the plant has already gone into dormancy, and um, and I won't get that strong suckering. So if we want to remove any bigger branches, we want to do that in the later summer where the plants have already reached dormancy, uh, are starting to reach dormancy, yes. Uh, this is why I was saying earlier, it's going to be uh, very important to keep on track. <laughs> there's just so much to talk about. I actually don't have any idea what time it is. Pardon? I have actually no idea what time it is. Okay. Just keep going. So we're going to keep going. <laughs> Again, so now I Rita says great info, ladies. So okay, there's people good. out there who are learning a lot here. Super. So again, here I want to see the plant from all all perspective. I have a nice, nice clean base, and uh, 
now I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to start pruning by going for the largest growth because it's the oldest and I want to have a, a good balance of younger, younger branches and older branches. Anything bigger than your thumb generally uh, can come out and anything smaller than your pinky finger, don't let it linger. <laughs> it's, it's stuck with me since I was at school. So I'm going to go in here and... So Joanna, I think our feet will go a little past 1.30. Okay. Okay, as it's 1.25 right okay. now. Okay. So I'm going to take the middle one out. And as you can see, I'm going as low as I can. And... And now I'm going to start thinking about opening of the um, of the plant. So I have some crossing small branches. So I will go in and take one small branch out. Now I have these two that are very uh, kind of old. And I have this one that's younger. So I'm going to select one of the older ones to make room and you're trying to get as close to the ground as possible yeah so the the reason why again if I'll i get down cut, there so i can show people yeah if yeah. i cut this and leave this stub yeah. longer uh here i'm gonna make a stub just to so everyone knows what i mean by that i'm gonna cut uh, i'm gonna cut this one out also this big one so if i cut it like this and you've got about a three inch stub there right yeah, now. Yeah, so this stub is going to keep rotting until it reaches this other branch here. Um, and this rotting part is going to be a great environment for anything that we don't want. So any diseases or pests uh, will be attracted to this kind of rotting wet. Uh, so. See, I'm noticing that your stubs that you're creating are sticking up no more than a third of an inch. Yeah, you want from to the ground it as low as you can get um, and we have not talked about the angle of cut yet we're gonna touch on that when we get to the cherry uh, because with you know here really with these shrubs with this um, red current I'm really the only pruning I'm gonna do is right at the base I'm not gonna get into pruning anything at the top here because it's not it's not really necessary. So I've got a little pile going there. I'm going to take this out to open it up because it's crossing. And then I'm going to see this one is kind of crossing and it's, it's small and flimsy. So I'm going to take this out. And here I've got two that are crossing. This one has been uh, oh yeah, this one is actually part of the bigger one, so I'm going to just cut this lower. That would be what you call interfering? Interfering. <laughs> is cro well, crossing and interfering, yes. Uh, so, this one is kind of, you know, I don't know what it's doing. It's going in this way, so I'm going to take that out. And... You actually don't want the plant to look like it's been pruned when you're done with it. That's kind of the, the when it comes to the art of pruning, is making it so you can't tell. Uh, you know, last year I was, I was pruning a beauty bush for someone, and when I was done, I've removed at least 30%, and the person said, oh, I can't tell that you did anything. And it's like, okay, well, that's a good, good sign. <laughs> Because you don't want to have this plant that looks all uh, cut and um, when it comes to pruning conifers, there's actually, you know, tricks of hiding the cut, uh, cutting it on an angle and uh, making it look so you can't actually see. So this was a little dead piece that just came right out. So I'm pretty much done here. And again, if these plants are pruned every year, then we can take a little bit out every year. We don't have to go in and do this big, uh, you know, big job. So here we have, this is growing. I think I should do this in two parts. Shrubs and trees. 
Okay, so now I am feeling like, okay, I'm getting to the point where I need to really stop. So I have this, I have this internal uh, alarm <laughs> that says, okay, it's time to stop. And the, the funny thing with pruning is that, you know, I can stop now and I can come back tomorrow and I'll see something else that I want to take out. So, uh, but I'm going to stop at this point. Probably takes us a while to develop that internal alarm though, doesn't it? Yeah. You got to practice. It totally does. And I, I, my biggest thing with pruning is that, you know, it, it can be intimidating. So people tend to not feel relaxed about doing it. And I encourage people to to do it just do it on a really small like uh start slow you know just start small and if you remember those key elements uh you can kind of work towards developing uh, a comfort with your with your pruning skills so i'm gonna leave this red current now you can see how um, much more open it is in the middle there's more air and it's kind of nicely balanced there's one more thing. See, I'm seeing here these little spindly guys. I'm going to take them out. And, uh, oh, look, you see, this is what happened. Done. I have to walk away now. <laughs> so this is my pile. You know, this is, I think I took enough out. Uh, maybe more like 40% or something, 30, I don't know, but I need to stop now. And you know, if you wanted to, uh, the thing about propagating these, uh, you could actually uh, lay, if you lay this branch down on the ground and bury it under the, you know. Now we're getting into propagation. Oh no! You could actually put a stone on here. And this is called layering. And this plant will then root through the season and you can cut it off and have more red currants. I encourage everyone to eat red currants because they're very sour and it's good to develop those, uh, tease those sour taste buds. Okay. Do you want to do the cherry today? Uh, what do you think? It's up to you. I'm I think there's people there. Give us a... <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do a quick demo on a cherry that is uh, in desperate need of pruning. I'm going to try to not rush through it as now I feel uh, a little bit rushed, but it's really hard not to, you know, get too into this because there are so many little details. So, so can I ask a question about the wood that you cut away? Yeah. Can you stick that in a vase and force those blossoms or is it too late for that right now? Because some, some people like to bring those, like, you know, you bring your bu the buds in and if you put them in water, you can get they can forced yeah, yeah they will flower I mean you know you'll get the leaves and everything you'll get a little bit of you know of green growth in your house which is always nice yeah um, well Michael Smith says red currants make great jelly yes, yes. and Cedar McLean says do the cherry all right Cedar we're doing the cherry all right so we have uh, here we have an, a Liberty apple that also needs some attention Liberty is one of my favorite apple culture uh, varieties. So, if you're looking to purchase apples, this one was purchased at Hillside, so they'll probably have some more this year. Uh, okay, so I'm going to sterilize my. I'm not super worried about transferring anything from the red currant to this cherry. Now we have had couple seasons of fruit with this sour cherry which is very exciting. Uh, we, we snack on them during our garden sessions and share them with the birds of course. So uh, this sour cherry actually uh, you know should, I'm going to use the word should, have been like, taken care of a little sooner but we're getting to it now which is good. Uh, and it's a good example to really see something that needs uh, more work than, you know, a plant where you just walk and do four cuts and you're done. So it's actually a really good example. So when I come to this tree, uh, I want to think about where, where I want to start. So I know that, um, you know, first we have to go through the dead... 
uh, dead disease <laughs> crossing and interfering, right? So right away, I'm going to to take you know the bottom out because I know that this is not really um, where I want this tree to go in terms of its future. I want to think about the scaffold, the branches, so the permanent. Uh, the permanent canopy. Where do I want it to really start? So, uh, and that is something you know that we get into with training trees, which is very important. Uh, because if we train them, if we take care of them and train them uh, from the young uh, stage, then we have a better structure later, and then less problems to correct and less bigger cuts. So here, I'm going to go ahead and cut this bottom out because it's interfering for sure and I'm going to talk a little bit here if I show you see something sure. closer uh, again we're going to talk about the angle of cut so with with the uh, um, trees we don't want to cut this on a straight angle so this kind of a 45 angle is generally what we want to cut it. And again, here I want to cut as close to the trunk because this, is, uh, if I leave a stub, um, this is kind of an, an open entry point to, uh, to any problems. So I want to cut this as low as I can. And when it comes to this branch here, what I'm actually going to do it uh, is a technique called subordination pruning. So I'm not going to cut. Uh, so if you come here, I should to the other side. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this this area of the plant. So what I have here is uh, what's called a branch collar. So I don't want to cut into that zone because then I'm creating more damage and what we want is the plant to, to callus over and close off. Um, also if you look, uh, I'm going to keep the way my, my loppers are here, I'm not going to prune in this way because I, I will automatically create a stub. So your your flat side needs to be facing the uh, the branch so I'm gonna cut right there and because so what I'm doing with this plant is called subordination pruning so I'm trying to short because I don't want to remove this big branch which I, I don't want here all at once I just want to uh, cut it lower and by keeping it kind of cut back, I will slow its growth around here. So the trunk will start to continue getting bigger, but this will not get bigger. So when I go to remove it, the wound left behind is going to be smaller. So when I was talking about the, um, you know, the injury of the trees, we, we want to think about, uh, Think about that element. So here, I'm actually going to subordinate it from here because I can do it over like two, three seasons. So again, I want to cut. So there's the the ridge branch bark ridge. It's kind of cool if you guys go out there and just look at the tree and see all these different features. So there's branch bark ridge. And then there's a collar, which is not as easy to see. It's it's like a little bit of a, a swelling. Uh, so we don't want to cut into either of those because then the tree will not. So here I'm already making a mistake by injuring the, uh, the branch next to it. And this is your, you know, the angle that you want, right? So you don't want it to be flat, but you want it to be just slanted enough. And again, the objective here is to have as little surface area as possible. Uh, and then there's another element that's very important. 
is that when we're pruning anything on top like this, this branch here has to be at least a third of diameter of the main branch of the branch that we're cutting off. If this is going to be any smaller, like the one below it is quite a bit smaller. Yeah, but yeah. this one here right. has to be able to support, uh, you know, the, the what we're going to do. If it was much smaller, it would probably it would probably die. Well, that's why you wouldn't cut down lower, right? Uh, like closer to the thin. Yeah, yeah. possibly. And okay. you know, we actually could cut lower. Uh, so here, we want to also think about the direction. So it's actually a better because uh, we want to direct this growth away instead of crowding more up here. Uh, and then you know, because these are small now, and I know they're not going to stay. I'm going to take these off. Uh, and then this, you can see, if they come closer, you can, this is a perfect example of a dead, dead branch here. Uh, so I'm going to take that off. Uh, so again, this is now going to stay. I'm going to take this off too. See how we're just like directing it away. I'll back up so folks can get a good look. Yeah, and then this. And this will now stay. It'll stay like that. Next year I can come and maybe do one more cut and slowly knock it down over a few years to cut it to to where I want it. Uh, to remove that branch. So this is what you would do if you have a tree that's gone too far and, uh, and you need to do some corrective pruning. So now um, I'm going to, you know, step back and take a look. You can already see how different this tree looks just by removing those two uh, those two branches. And I know that my permanent, you know, my permanent canopy is going to start here. So I know that I can leave this going out even though it's crossing because this is not going to stay. Um, so would you do that one next year? So I yeah, and this one I'm going to clean up a little bit uh, and again because we're gonna be doing this annually we can do these small steps you know like um, I would let's say take this off this year because it's an obvious crossing uh, I know that this is not staying uh, maybe I will cut this this bud here to create uh, less congestion and then Sai says, what is that? So it's a cherry. What kind of a sour cherry? It's a sour cherry, yeah. So next I want to think about um, you know the general kind of so the congestion is often, you know, where where branches kind of grow into each other. And what we really want to avoid is what's called lion tailing. So if I had branches here and I took them all off because I want to bigger trees a little bit more where we really want to be careful where uh, you know how how the wind affects our trees in, in, in terms of its their safety so but lion tailing generally you know is is not um, something that looks good either you get this kind of a lollipop idea so here this is this is my concern right here right this branch here uh, I, I want to open it up so it goes to here more, um, but again, what do I do? Do I do the cut this year, considering that I've only done uh, three cuts? Maybe I can afford. I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it, and this will allow me to show you one more technique before we run out of power. We're at the garden, so we don't have. Um, so when you're cutting a bigger branch. And this might be happening if you're, you know, removing bigger branches of your apples that you want to rejuvenate at the end of the summer. Uh, you don't want to do your final cut at the end where you want it if the branch is bigger because it's heavy. So this is uh, this is called a bypass cut. So you will actually um, make a stub first. 
and this will mean that the branch is not just going to fall down and rip create this tear on your branch so you can actually just snap this off and it you know it's also handy when you're cutting bigger trees and you just want them to kind of stand and you can literally just take it off like you can see here um, so now I'm just left with this little stub which doesn't have any weight on it um, and I'm gonna do my final cut here and you know you can always see how well you are cutting by how the tree is going to be healing because if you get nice closing of the of the cambium all around it means it means that you didn't injure uh, any of the tissues around so I don't know I always like to see <laughs> but go back a few years later and see how well I did on my cuts but that's my own uh, my own problem or uh, okay so here crossing and interfering we're gonna leave we know we're gonna leave this to, uh, to keep growing so I'm gonna take I'm just gonna do a few more cuts here and then uh, we pretty much will be done so uh, these two are definitely um, I'm gonna take this one off and again just no stubs and no uh, and I'm gonna just shorten this one because I don't really need to remove it all at once and you know when it comes to suckers on your apple trees crab apples are very uh, you know prone to suckering and you have this tendency to want to just go and clear them all off the you know as they come up and often you know maybe you've had the experience where you clear all the suckers and then you turn around especially if you do it in the early spring um, Michael has a question. Yeah. Do cherry trees produce vertical water shoots like the apple? I always remove them on my apple trees. So that's Relevant to what you're talking about right now. Exactly. Yeah. So these guys don't. Uh, so they are, um, you know, a little bit more forgiving in terms of how we can prune them. They, you can see they have actually a combination of regular growth and spur growth. So these are, the spur growth is these, are these little clumps. Of, it's kind of like a, you know a, a con, uh, compressed growth and that's where uh, uh, a lot of the fruit buds are so the apples that create a lot of water shoots uh, suckers uh, you want to be careful to not remove them all because they will just keep coming back so and they do have a purpose in terms of you know they create uh, you know they have leaves so they create food for the plants so I generally only remove half of the suckers and again just knock them back so you can cut them back halfway and then if you want to remove a little bit more of them go there in August when the plant is not going to react by growing more and then you can remove a little bit more of them but generally if your tree is suckering a lot it means that the pruning should not be it's over no. oh. <laughs> the pruning shouldn't be uh, really hard. So Carmen asked about um, shoots growing at the base and I think you've kind of explained to take out only about half at a time. Well the base shoots you can take out because they're you know they're not as um, they're not as problematic I find as the as the ones on the branches because right. the ones on the branches really create a lot of um, you know congestion and 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 prop kind of visual and also um, structural problems. Uh, sometimes we can train a sucker, you know, if we have a damaged tree, we can actually take advantage of a sucker and train it into another branch. But it's generally a growth that's really fast and really succulent, so it's, it's structurally unstable. But the ones on the bottom, you know, you might have to do it a few times in the summer, but I like to clean the bottom suckers off. Uh, ginkgo trees have a very strong tendency to sucker also at the base, so take them out uh, and take your, you know, Oh man, take your multiple leaders off. <laughs> That's another topic. I think we're going to have to have a part two. We're going to have to have a part two sometime. So anyway, I hope that this, um, you know, gave you a good base to your um, pruning knowledge. You can kind of get started and go out there. Just take a look and see what your trees are doing. And uh, don't be afraid, but don't go too hard. Hard pruning. Uh, you know, the important part, if your apples, for example, have fire blight, 
fire blight is very attracted to uh, you know kind of strong succulent uh, growth so if you have a tree that has fire blight you go prune it hard and then it sends all sorts of suckers um, just they'll just have more problems could people send you an email if they had further questions yes please send me an email you can reach me at joanna at the table cfc Org. I would be happy to help anyone grow uh, better trees, better gardens, and anything else that you need help with. Thank you uh, for tuning in. And uh, on Tuesday, Aisha will be in the kitchen preparing some, uh, some delicious food with lentils. So please log into our Facebook Live on Tuesday at 10.30 to join Aisha Tour and her delicious cooking. Goodbye everyone.